In this offering, I will share reality, perception, wonder, archetype, and hopefully a sprinkle of wisdom regarding the sky luminaries. Many are looking to the horizon, to the shape, to computer screens, to other land, to mental models, but not many are looking up at what is actually real and observable. Most notable in the luminaries mysterium is what we call the sun, an epic and enigmatic source of real cycles, real energy and real wonder. The sun is a focal point of life-giving heat and light. Only a fool states they know what it is. The close sun within our realm makes one full westward revolution every 24 hours, spiralling out and gradually faster to the Tropic of Capricorn on the winter solstice. and spiralling in and gradually slower to the Tropic of Cancer on the summer solstice, thus giving us the seasons. The analema is where one takes a photo or plot point of the sun at the same time of day from the same location over a year. This is from Hong Kong in the Northern Hemisphere and there is a bigger loop for when the sun is in the Southern Hemisphere because the sun covers more distance there in its orbit. This clearly shows that the orbit of the sun expands and contracts. It matters not if the analema is taken from the equator or from the southern hemisphere either. The southern loop is always bigger, as one would expect. The sun comes into the observer's vanishing point. This is known to most as a sunrise. The sun goes out of the observer's vanishing point. This is known to most as a sunset. If we go up in altitude, the sun comes back into one's field of view as the vanishing point has increased. When the sun sets in Japan, it's at its zenith in Madagascar and also rising in Florida. Some ballpark trigonometry shows the sun is around 2,000 to 4,000 miles away. Well, that is, if it is an actual thing within the rules of known physics, which it possibly isn't. Now these sunrises and sunsets often appear as different sizes. This is due to one or more of the following. The observer's position, land contour, sea temperature, atmospheric haze, and atmospheric temperature. The sun doesn't have flares, but it does have sunspots. Nobody knows what these are, or what creates them. But they do help us prove that the sun above oscillates, which appears to the observer as rotation. The actual light of the sun does many wondrous and irrational things, near impossible to work out logically. Here is the model for sunlight observation for various months. We don't even know if it is really an object. We do know it is a focal point of light and heat. For me it is probably intelligent consciousness in some way, maybe half in this reality and half in another. It could just be far beyond our comprehension altogether, a reflective or geometric masterpiece of spiritual consciousness. The moon is the other large luminary in the sky. It has always been an enigma. It has always been worshipped, and its energy through its mystical phases affect much life in this reality. The moon is the same size and distance as the sun, and follows close to the sun's path, the ecliptic. The moon takes about 24 hours and 51 minutes to complete a revolution above us, slower than the sun. The moon is always close to the ecliptic, within 5 degrees above or below. The moon crosses the sun's ecliptic 
approximately every two weeks. These crossings are known as lunar nodes. If it crosses the ecliptic at full moon, we have a lunar eclipse. If it crosses the ecliptic at new moon, we have a solar eclipse. The moon takes an average of 29 days, 12 hours and 44 minutes to go through one lunar month, one lunar cycle, from new moon through waxing, full, waning, back to new moon. Because of this motion, the moon has a point in time each lunar month when it is closest to the earth, perigee, and a point in time where it is farthest from the earth, apogee. The sun moves faster than the moon. The sun catches up with it, creating a new moon, and then speeds ahead of it. More accurately here, we can see the lunar phases are caused by the relative geometry of the moon to the sun in the flat earth sky. These two luminaries are linked by what one could call pranic, magnetic electro or chi energy. The first quarter moon is when it is half illuminated and occurs when the sun and moon are 90 degrees apart in the sky. At full moon, the moon is fully powered and fully illuminated when the sun and moon are 180 degrees apart in the sky. The moon self-luminates and self-deluminates. It powers up and powers down. There is evidence to suggest this geometric relationship creates the tides in the oceans too, as salt water is ionized and can react to magnetic electro. Another way of talking about the motion of these luminaries is to say the moon travels 14.5 degrees an hour and the sun 15 degrees an hour. So the moon loses 12 degrees a day on the sun. People are okay that the sun is self-luminating, so people should also be okay that the moon is self-luminating too. A nice way to remember if the moon is waxing or waning is if it is like a letter C or D. A cat goes, waning, and a dog comes, waxing. This works as a geometric clockwork a calendar in the sky, so to speak. Chinese, Thai, Hindu, Islam and Hebrew calendars still today are linked to the moon cycles, the lunar month. If one photographs the moon 51 minutes later on successive days, note, due to the moon rising about 51 minutes later each day, over one lunar month it will trace out its own analemma. The moon can be seen above in the sky at the same time in distant places, Depending on where one is on a line of longitude depends on what degree of rotation the moon will be. To a stationary observer, the moon also appears to rotate as it moves from east to west in the sky. This is only due to perspective. The moon is not actually rotating. It's almost as if the moon and sun are piercing into this reality or piercing into a layer in our sky. Both look like spheres to our subconscious, but simply this cannot be so. The word eclipse comes from a Greek word meaning abandonment. Quite literally, an eclipse was seen as the sun on a solar eclipse and moon on a lunar eclipse abandoning Earth. The lunar eclipse is only possible exactly on a full moon, when the sun and moon are directly opposite and also when the moon is at the crossing point of the ecliptic, at the lunar node, when h1 and h2 in the image are at the same altitude. Any solar year has a minimum of four eclipses, two solar and two lunar, and it is possible to have up to six or seven eclipses in a single solar year. The moon is full, fully charged, and then it loses power, preparing energy retracting. Then it sparks, surges, pulses. The moon becomes reddish as it continues its potent energetic link with the sun. A pranic or magnetic electro handshake with the sun. Blinking, flickering. It seems to be a reset of sorts and then it regains power. The lunar eclipses are seen where it is night time and over a massive land space with the same intensity. 
They last for a few hours, much longer than the minutes of a solar eclipse. The change in colour during a lunar eclipse is seen simultaneously by people in different continents. And because of this, the obstruction theory from old Vedic myth is impossible. The theory that it is obstructed by another celestial body, such as Rahu, Ketu, Shadow Planet, Mount Maru, Black Sun or Lilith is easily debunked as it would only be visible in a small location. You see, with this lunar eclipse, any obstructing body would be huge, many times bigger than the moon. A solar eclipse is only possible exactly on a new moon, when the sun and moon are directly together, and also when the moon is at the crossing point of the ecliptic, at the lunar node, when h1 and h2 in the image are at the same altitude. But looking at these filtered images, nothing is there. It matters not what one does with telescope or imagery software, one cannot find a trace of the moon. It is as though the sun eats itself. It's really important you understand the moon is not there, then you might wake up to the magic and mysticism of this realm we are in. The moon is awash with mystique, myth, superstition and esoterica. The new moon is like a start of a wave, the start of new intentions. The full moon is like the crashing of the wave, and the waning moon is like the decay of a wave retreating. A healthy woman in her power has her menstrual cycle during or near full moon or new moon. It is more beneficial esoterically to fast or cleanse the days before a new moon. At full moon, the pineal gland opens more and the spiritual veil is thinner so to speak. Most humans have dense energy and live in the five senses and personality matrix and are disconnected from the moon's energetic cycles. The moon phases also affect the planting of crops and plants and many many other things. Some even say Islam and Allah came from a lunar cult, from pre-Islamic Arabic myth. In hermetic alchemy, the sun and moon need to be reconciled within the self. The inner male and female, logic and emotion, communication and feeling, all united in perfect balance before the elixir can be achieved. The word planet comes from the Greek word planetos, meaning wandering star. The wandering stars are eight specific luminaries in the sky. From the left in the image, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and the dimmer and slower Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. The wandering stars are rays of energy, and they represent certain ideas and archetypes, a conception of the universe, inside you too, the macrocosm in the microcosm, the microcosm in the macrocosm, as above, so below. This ancient geocentric model was actually pretty close to the truth and lasted for over a thousand years before the elite smashed it up. The error here is that each of the wandering stars are actually all quite close to the ecliptic. Each are probable to be a similar distance from the Earth. But correctly here, some are faster than others. Note too that each wandering star has a unique brightness and colour. Another crude way to aesthetically show the wandering stars is here, all close to the ecliptic. Each of the wandering stars has its own retrograde motion. Retrograde is a term used to describe the phenomenon of each wandering star stopping and then reversing direction in the flat earth sky, before continuing forwards again. Also it is not certain if the retrograde motions are doing a loop in altitude, or simply going into retrograde at the same altitude. I cannot repeat enough that each wandering star has a unique motion stroke cycle that is independent from all other sky luminaries. These motions, no matter how they are depicted, always present harmonic geometry. Mercury is not what the elite wants you to think it is, a rotating spherical rock 50 million miles away 
has mind controlled the masses? The adjectives that come to my mind are divine, geometric, fractal, interdimensional and conscious. Mercury always travels close to the sun and due to this it is the most difficult to see with the naked eye. Does Mercury orbit the sun? Is this a loop, like Ptolemy thought? We don't really know for sure, but it is probable at least sometimes due to Mercury sometimes not passing behind the sun, but passing in front of the sun, 13 or 14 times per century, known as the Mercury transit. Now one needs special filters to witness this, and it helps prove just how small the wandering stars are. The next Mercury transit is in November 2019, then in 2032. This event lasts about 6 hours or so. So usually Mercury passes behind the Sun, or does it do something similar to the Moon and disappear when close to the Sun? Who's to say it hasn't disappeared when in front, and the black circle is due to some magnetic electro or pranic handshake, akin to a solar eclipse? It is said that Mercury has phases, just like the Moon, a long 88 day cycle to complete the phases. That the 26% phase on the left is bigger than the 51% phase next to it, if these images are trustworthy, this would suggest a looping higher in altitude during retrograde. The most notable deities and archetypes linked to Mercury were the Roman god of wealth, word and commerce. Also Hermes, the Greek god of alchemy, born from Thoth, the Egyptian god of writing, knowledge and the emerald tablet. Venus is far from what your local gatekeeper school science teacher thinks. Here we can see the Sun and Moon, Mercury in orange and Venus in small white. Like Mercury, Venus always travels close to the Sun, but is slower and travels further away from the Sun than Mercury, in a slower cycle ensuring Venus to be the morning star before the Sun, or the evening star after the Sun. This Venus cycle takes 225 days. To the naked eye, Venus doesn't appear to twinkle, but instead glows with a bright and steady silvery light, making her the second brightest light in the night sky, after the Moon. Out of the wandering stars, it is only Venus and Mercury that have phases, so Venus also appears to get smaller and bigger, so again, it either has an apogee and perigee, or it simply gets smaller and bigger where it is, at the same altitude. Venus is the only other wandering star, as well as Mercury, that sometimes appears to pass in front of the Sun. Like Mercury, we don't really know if it is in front of the Sun, or in the Sun, or if it disappears like the Moon due to some pranic handshake. A Venus transit is more rare though. Note that Venus appears larger than Mercury when transiting the Sun. Mars, Saturn and Jupiter are less complex. They simply move around the ecliptic with no care for the Sun or any other luminaries. They each sometimes go retrograde too, but no phases and no transits. The luminaries in the sky simply doing their own thing. They say Mars has two moons, Jupiter 64, Saturn 62, but there is no evidence these are moons. We can just see a few small luminaries in the sky that hang out with a bigger luminary. There is also no evidence of any rings at Saturn. Mars takes 687 days to complete its cycle. Jupiter takes 12 years and Saturn takes 29 years. Again, due to their retrograde motions, many geometric patterns can be found between these wandering stars. I'm old school and don't really care too much for Uranus, Neptune or Pluto. They are so dim and slow, and they were only discovered in recent centuries. They say Uranus has 27 moons, Neptune 13 and Pluto 5. Again, just tiny lights in the sky that hang out. These three generational forces 
simply move around the ecliptic super slow. Uranus takes 87 years, Neptune 165 years, and Pluto 248 years to get back to the same place, on the ecliptic, to complete their cycle. They are known in the matrix as outer planets, but in reality they are simply dimmer and slower, and there is no evidence they are further away. Due to points of retrograde over tens of thousands of years, Uranus and Neptune will do their own geometric dance. There is a whole host of geometry in the sky when looking at various combinations of wandering stars, but no evidence of spheres, rocks, gas giants, light years, or any other of the government fairy tales. The wandering stars are each magnificent and radiant forces of energy that contain the human psyche and our subconscious archetypes. These show the levels of vibration, the levels of frequency, from a spiritual perspective. There are another three levels of vibration spiritually for each wandering star that the eyes cannot see. And Kabbalah uses these forces as a climbing frame and roadmap, so to speak. Many of you have fear of this information and call it bad, but Kabbalah and rays of energy in this realm are neither good or bad, they just are. The key is really the individual's own level of purity. I go into this much more in a book I wrote over 10 years ago now. Now Cornelius Agrippa was a German theologian and Christian mystic. He wrote the Arbitel in the early 1500s. In his system, he created a clean and divine way, using the correct day and planetary hour, of having commune with the God Force from each of the celestial spheres, from each of the seven sacred wandering stars. The Arbitel tells us that Olympic spirits, well, gods that rule the wandering stars, inhabit the firmament, which was the air and regions of space that held the stars together. The job of these gods is to declare destinies so far forth as God allows them. The gig here is not to worship the Olympic spirits, but to balance them in oneself and then move on to attain a unity with the God who expresses itself through these seven rays. The blanket of fixed stars all move in unison, as one, with next to no evidence of any parallax. The blanket of stars are probable to all reside at the same altitude, behind and higher than the wandering stars, and probable to be somewhere between 3,000 and 4,000 miles away from Earth. There are under 10,000 stars visible to the naked human eye, and because of the human eye's vanishing point, one can only see less than half of those from where one stands. What are the stars? We don't have the correct labels in our vocabulary. The words that arise for me are geometric, intelligent, fractal, divine, holographic, interdimensional. Some even appear as diamonds. Some hollow. Is water involved? Is soul luminescence involved, where high frequency sound waves in liquid cause a bubble to implode into light? Are cymatics involved?
the language of resonant frequency. If one zooms past a star and then increases the brightness, it can appear to the eye like the star is indented into the firmament. This is 160 times zoom at sunset with clear visibility. We just don't know. The luminary's mysterium cloaks its secrets from us. The blanket of stars revolve around Polaris, the North Star above the central North Pole. With time lapse, we can see this day after day, rolling out the lie of four motions. To find Polaris in the northern sky, just look for Ursa Minor or Ursa Major. From Chicago, we look north and we see the stars rotate around Polaris, and from Paris. and from near Japan. This is from southern Spain. The stars complete one cycle, stroke one revolution, every 23 hours, 56 minutes and 4 seconds, making them a little faster than the sun, with the moon being the slowest of the three. There is a ring of 12 star constellations behind the ecliptic, known as the signs of the zodiac. This is the same even if one is in Chicago, North Mexico, Southern Chile, or anywhere on Earth. So if one splits the circular 360 degree ecliptic up into 12, one gets 12 times 30 degrees, each being a sign of the zodiac, which all takes 23 hours, 56 minutes and 4 seconds to revolve above us. These constellations appear upside down to people in the southern areas of Earth for the simple reasons shown here. As the stars take 23 hours, 56 minutes, 4 seconds to revolve, and the sun takes 24 hours to revolve, every 30 days or so, the sun enters a new sign of the zodiac, and then will spend around 30 days there until the zodiac has overtaken the sun again. Due to us knowing all of the main speeds in the sky now, here is the approximate time each luminary spends within each of the 12 signs of the zodiac. Nobody knows who first grouped the 12 constellations on the ecliptic, but it is ancient, received from a higher state of consciousness. Each sign has been anthropomorphized as figures, animals and archetypes. Each sign has been studied and wondered over by mystics, astrologers, healers and artists. The zodiac splits up the 12 months, 4 seasons, solstices and equinoxes. What zodiac sign a wandering star sits in is key to how the wandering star is filtered, and each combination of wandering star and sign is vastly different. You should understand most of these symbols now. Think of each wandering star as a function of the psyche within all human beings. Think of each zodiac sign as the location of what the particular psyche function is seeking, how and where it will play out. So this is what astrology is, the wandering star and the zodiac signs in constant movement behind the ecliptic. Remember, all 12 signs and all the wandering stars each have a specific energy. The natal chart really yields gnosis on the self. Each day, the different permutations of geometric aspects in the sky and the combinations of energies in the sky 
all create flux in this reality. It gets human dynamic and interaction in this reality moving and changing. If one overlays one's natal chart with today's sky chart, or tomorrow's, or next week's, or any date or time in the future, one can see what energies are at play and navigate that moment, or that hour, or that day, whether it be a meeting, or a wedding, or a new project. And the elite really don't want you to know this stuff. But Wall Street, governments, and the military all use this science of the sky. There are flat earth zodiac clocks and zodiac symbolism all around old European churches. So it's a little bit strange that many modern day Christians look at astrology as something bad. So sit back and take in the next minute or so. We still need to cover some of the other luminaries in the sky, ones with wild stories within the zombie matrix. The idea of galaxies is deranged, just a luminary of cloudiness in the sky. This is what they call Andromeda. The idea of nebulas is demented, just shaped light in the sky. The elite tell you it is an interstellar cloud of dust, hydrogen, helium and other ionised gases. That the Orion Nebula is 1,300 light years away and 12 light years in radius. I mean, tell a tall story or what? I mean, this elite are smart, but also very psychotic. A comet is simply a cyclic luminary in the sky with its own cyclic path, with no care for the ecliptic. Shooting stars are simply lights that wisp across the sky, appearing randomly, but often at synchronistic moments. The Perseids shower every August is the brightest. These are not meteorites. 
there is no evidence of these so-called meteorites ever landing on Earth. If these were real, every month or so a house or a building would be destroyed. And other mainstream news agencies don't really give us any hard evidence. These scorched rocks do exist though, but obviously they do not come from the fairy tale that is outer space. This is supposed to be the biggest meteorite on Earth. No crater nearby, no witnesses. Now to diverse just a little bit, giant craters probably were created from sinkholes or from some ancient technology. We don't really know. But we do know that a lump of rock didn't land and then just vaporise on impact. More on the cover up of meteorites and craters is in my Edge documentary. The dense and cloudy area of stars in the sky is known as the Milky Way. This is not really what this was called. This was called the Great Rift or the Dark Rift by different people all around the world. I did a whole documentary exploring some of the ancient myths and knowledge surrounding this area of the sky luminaries. Feel free to check it out. The northern lights are highly probable to come out of the north centre. We don't know what they are, but they must be linked to magnetic electro. The sky is a giant calendar. The sun tells the time, the moon tells us the day and the stars tell us the months and years. We live inside a beautiful realm, a perfectly designed timepiece, with mathematics and fractals within its fabric. The sky is the only real tangible calendar. What else is there to live by? The toxic Gregorian calendar the Catholics fed you? Dates your boss tells you? Days of celebration your governments tell you? Or is it wiser to live by the energies and events in the sky? The dance of the luminaries, the art of astrology, which is happening above your head. And you don't give it a moment's thought because you've been conditioned not to care or wonder or contemplate. This realm is divine. It is created by higher consciousness, a higher power. The luminary's dance of geometry allows the one thing to weave energy into this dimension through rays of energy. A subtle and gentle communication to our minds and souls, forever changing the permutations, creating a foundation of flux for this realm we are in, a realm of divine fractals hidden from our consciousness. So beautiful yet so subtle. The elite hide the truth of the luminaries as they are trying to limit the whole human experience to the physical. The physical is only a base, it's not the real thing. They want you pushed into the Sephiroth of Malkut, as a materialistic conforming drone. But we are both visible and invisible. We need to honour the totality, not just what we can touch. Da Vinci said, there are three types of people, those who see, those who see when shown, and those that don't see. And one starts to see only when one starts deprogramming. And it's not an easy ride, but it does get easier. This is the work of the modern day warriors, deprogramming. The Luminaries Mysterium is a key out of the Matrix out of the cult-like scientism religion, but you have to embrace the sky's truth. Love the sky, a beautiful gift from our creator. Many of you are trying to rationalize a divine mysterium, and one's life here is full of questions, but only fools are full of answers.